Good afternoon. My name is uh, Georgi Derlugyan, uh, and I have an honor and pleasure today to moderate this session, to play a moderating role, to moderate passions, if you may, during this session. This session is devoted to a very important topic. Very uh, shortly, very briefly, I will tell you what is divergence lessons. What do we mean under divergence lessons? Divergence is a split of the world. For the last 200 years, for East and West, and uh, for rich and poor areas of the world. In this way, someone become poorer, someone become richer, some uh, regions are rich now, some regions are poor. And uh, what uh, trends do we experience now? It's a conversion, it's an opposite conversion, whether the poor will catch up with the rich ones. This topic is endless, by the way. The topic is has um, uh, obvious applied meaning. It's not just a history. It is, uh, and um, I'm really uh, happy that we have uh, three uh, um, good experts in these topics. and. Um, You know, so divergence means between the rich and poor regions, and the rich and poor regions in the world, within countries. Uh, and let me ask you, you know, so who, is, uh, who volunteers to go first? Please, Charles Calamiris, with the, the clicker. What a pleasure it is to be here with all of you. Um, the smaller the session, the more serious the discussion, I think. And uh, so I really look forward to a smaller room like this where we can uh, have a, a deeper discussion of some of these important issues. So let's see if we get a, uh, some slides. I need my slides today. Well, I, I do have my computer with me that has them, and I have them here. Yeah, I have them here. Oh, you have? Well, I have it right here, too. <clears throat> so it's the one that says Guide Our History Session. And we don't want to get the wrong presentation on because it could, who knows what it could be. <laughs> it could be. Uh, but anyway, it's, I'll start talking because I remember what the first slide uh, says. And uh, the question uh, that this session is posing, oh, uh, if it should have the word guidar and history in it. It should be at the... The, the most recent file, so if you order them by date, uh, would you like me to? So there, you got it? Thank you, Carol. So uh, the, the question is, or the, the observation to start with is, that if you look around the world, you see an enormous variety in financial systems, and that's what I want to talk about, banking systems in particular. There we go. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to give an oversimplified discussion of this diversity. Uh, if you look around the world, you'll see that some financial systems are extremely deep in terms of the amount of bank credit that's available. And you'll also see that another dimension is whether the banking system blows up or doesn't blow up periodically. And what's interesting is that in some places, the financial system is very deep and stable. In other places, it's maybe deep and unstable. And in other places, it's uh, very shallow and unstable. Uh, so in other words, there's a lot of variety in performance. But what I want to 
uh, propose to you is what I'm going to call uh, the Anna Karenina theory of banking. As you know, Tolstoy famously said that unhappy families are all different, but happy families are all the same. And I'm going to argue that that's pretty much the case with banking. In other words, since the 1750s in Scotland, we have known what the technology of a successful banking system is. There isn't really a lot of variety of success. Success means a deep credit system. We know pretty much how to deliver it. Technology has changed, but the basic idea that was established in Scotland that with the particular pieces of it are all well known for commercial banking. It's a very old technology. Then in the late 19th century, we had some new innovations for combining banking functions with the underwriting process of bringing firms to securities markets. And then we created this thing called universal banking. Actually, Russia was one of the models of universal banking at the end of the 19th century. So the technology of creating successful ba banks that deliver plentiful credit on a stable basis, that's the happy family. And pretty much wherever it exists, it looks the same. The unhappy family is unstable and scarce credit. And there are many different explanations for it. They all have what I'm going to call the common element of being unwilling to uh, what I pursue something I call disciplined freedom. So I'm going to define that in a minute, but my proposition to you is that diversity, meaning all of these failed or, or uh, very different versions of unstable and scarce credit, are actually different particular political chosen reasons for unhappy banking that all are about a political intolerance for what I'm calling disciplined freedom. Okay, so my story is very simple. The happy families, that's a, something I'm going to call disciplined freedom. And the, all the unhappy families, the diversity, is all about an intolerance for this simple concept. So what do I mean by disciplined freedom? It has two parts. On the liability side, it's discipline. What that means is that the sources that are funding you are going to react to what you do and to how you run your business. That's discipline. So if you don't run your business properly, you don't get funded. The freedom part is, but you get to allocate your funds in the way you think makes sense. So what's the opposite of disciplined freedom? It's where the government is protecting you in terms of your funding. Your funding is guaranteed or given or somehow protected by the government, your sources of funding. But then also, that's part of a bargain in which you're also being told how to allocate your funding. So what I want to propose to you is, these are the two equilibria that I want you to be thinking about. On the one hand, disciplined freedom, where you have to satisfy the discipline of your funding sources, but are able to allocate the funds as you like. Or something else, you might call it protected control, the opposite of disciplined freedom. You're protected on the funding side, but then you're controlled in the uses of the funds. That is the unhappy story. And as you can see, there are many different versions of that unhappy story. Ways to protect you and ways to control you to particular uses. And so when you're looking at banking systems, if you look at them through this lens, I think you learn a lot about what the source of diversity is. It's a political choice not to allow disciplined freedom. I'll just give the Chinese example because it's the most obvious one. What's keeping the Chinese banking system from being a happy story? The fact that the banking system must serve the political purpose of funding politically favored enterprises, state-owned enterprises in particular, that couldn't raise funds if they had to actually compete for them. And so the banking system has to be protected so it can be controlled because they couldn't make bad loans like those loans to the state-owned enterprises if they didn't have a protected source of funds. So the government realizes, if, I have, if I'm going to use the banking system to prop up state-owned enterprises, I have to also give them protected sources of funds. 
because otherwise, how could I fund it? So you see these are two sides of the same coin. You can have a disciplined free banking system, or you can have a controlled protected banking system. OK. So how do disciplined banks raise funds? How do, you, how do they convince people? When I started working on banking about 35, 40 years ago, this was the puzzle I had in my mind. How could anyone ever decide voluntarily to give a banker any money? To me, that's very puzzling. Because suppose I said to you, all of you, please give me your money. Trust me, I'll allocate it in a good way. I'm not going to tell you who I'm lending it to. I'm not going to have you approve any of the loans I make. But you have deposits, accounts. Trust me, right? So the answer to the question, I think I now know, I've written about 20 papers over my career trying to get at this. I think now we understand. If banks maintain enough of a capital buffer, equity buffer, they can attract deposits. So it's the amount of cash they maintain in their asset side and the amount of equity they maintain on their liability side that makes them look financially sound. And you have to have some kind of credible examination or auditing process. So first of all, your balance sheet is part of what attracts funds. Secondly, making sure that your managers have good incentives, either with their having a large stake in the company themselves personally, or with setting up some kind of credible, formal corporate governance apparatus that disciplines the banker. And then third, having very short-term debt so that that debt can withdraw itself anytime it wants. Because as I like to say, if bankers aren't scared, banks aren't safe. So if you make bankers scared, then you know they're going to be careful. Because if they're not careful and people get wind of their being careless, all of a sudden they lose all their money. Since about the 6th century BC in ancient Athens, I would say this is what we mean by commercial banking. And it's these elements that allow banks to attract money. This is nothing new. This is what discipline's all about. Now, of course, there's a dark side to discipline. Banks can fail, sometimes very dramatically, with runs coming from deposits, because either for good reason or bad reason, depositors can decide to run the bank. And furthermore, if depositors are making banks have to manage their risk properly, what that means is, that if a bad shock happens to the bank, and let's say causes the bank to lose some of its uh, loans uh, value, that means that the bank has to become more careful, uh, lend less, and accumulate more cash. And what that means is that banks will tend to propagate, that is magnify, business cycle downturns. Because as a shock hits the bank that causes loan loss, the bank will have to contract its risk which means reduce its lending, which means it makes the recession worse. So the dark side of discipline is the potential for runs and also the potential to magnify the downside of recessions. By the way, that's what risk management is. It's not like this is something you can avoid, this, this negative tendency of magnifying recessions. That's what risk management requires. So get used to it. If you want a functioning banking system, that's what you're going to have. OK, now, how many of you have seen this painting in the Hermitage? There are two versions of it. This way it is. Yeah. So this is the first version of the painting. Uh, there's a final version of it, but the first version is much more interesting. So this is a Russian bank run. And each of these players, if you don't mind, I'm going to stand up to show you. I come from a large family, so I can speak very loudly. OK, so this fellow here is the bank president. He's off on the far right. This fellow here is the depositor who was the first. Yeah, good one. OK, come on. Uh, thank you. This is the depositor who was, who was, yeah, this is the depositor who was able to figure out that the bank might be in trouble and got to the front of the line and got his money out. This is the banker who's glaring at him for having caused problems. The bank, however, has run out of its reserves and can't pay any more depositors. How do we know that? 
look at the expressions on these people's faces. So they're told, sorry, the bank is out of money. We can't pay you right now. Now, when you look at this painting, you have the sense the banks must be horrible things because, and maybe very unfair. This is a very, very unfair painting. By the way, you might even say that there's an anti-Semitic aspect to this painting. I would say so. I would say this may be a caricature of a Jewish person. So I'm just saying, I'm, I, like, I like art. What is art saying? It's a drama about an unfair process of banking in which some people aren't getting their money and somebody, some clever fellow who was paying attention maybe, got his money. But what I want you to then ask the question, is this drama, thank you, is this dramatic view of a bad process, is that accurate? If in the United States we had uh, bank runs like this on individual banks, the depositors typically got almost all of their money back because this fellow who caused the bank to shut down brought attention on a bad situation and stopped maybe a fraudulent manager or an inexperienced or bad manager. There was some loss, but it was typically small. What's small? You lost maybe 5 to 15% of your deposits. And of course, it was also very rare. And so what's really interesting is, let's, be, let's quantify this. From 1874 to 1913, I've only been able to identify what I would call 10 global financial banking crises. Five of them occurred in the US, by the way. One of them occurred in Norway, one occurred in Australia, one occurred in uh, Brazil, one occurred in Argentina, one occurred in Italy. By the way, one did not occur in Russia. Although there were some bank failures, and there was an almost a crisis in 1899 and 1900, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the, the, the ones that did happen, these 10, had um, that was very, a very small number, right? And their severity in terms of the negative net worth of failed banks as a percentage of GDP was on average 3%, and the maximum was 10% in both Australia and Argentina. <clears throat> now, I want you to think about the last 40 years, a different 40-year period. 10 times as many events, about 100 major banking crises, and the average severity is 16% of GDP. That's called the global pandemic of banking crises that you're currently living through. And so the question is, why, what's going wrong? Because by the way, it wasn't just that banks were, are more stable in the past, but they also, many of them had more credit. If you were in Mexico in 1900, the bank credit to GDP ratio is much higher than it has ever been in Mexico since. And that's true of many other countries. Okay, so what I'm, without proving it to you, what I'm going to argue is, Disciplined freedom as a way of running banking systems was the rule historically, and that it resulted in much more stable credit and much more plentiful credit. What are the two gorillas I'm going to talk about then? It's the opposite of discipline and the opposite of freedom. And so what is going on in the modern banking system is number one, unconditional protection of banks, ex ante through deposit insurance, that's very generous often, or ex post through bank bailouts that are not conditional. That's the first gorilla in the room. And of course, unconditional protection makes bankers incompetent and reckless because they don't have to worry about the consequences, like in that painting, of being incompetent or reckless. The number two gorilla has to do with the control aspect. Not just, so protection is gorilla number one, control is gorilla number two. What is control? In democracies, it means promoting banks' involvement in housing finance. Housing finance is very politically popular. Democratic governments like to push it. And so they try to subsidize it with high leverage. And subsidized leverage tends to create major systemic crises, 
Real estate's very illiquid. If banks have large exposures to real estate, it tends to make crises highly correlated and illiquid exposures in banking loans, which is why 100 years ago, nobody would think this was a good idea, to have a lot of bank loans to real estate. That was not allowed. Guerrilla number two, though, takes a different form in autocracies. In autocracies, it's more like what we sometimes call crony capitalist banking, which is where industrialists who are part of the network of the crony get subsidized with access to bank credit. Think about Korean chebols, for example, and their use of uh, Korean banks. But there are many examples of this. And so the two gorillas in the room of banking instability that explain the pandemic are really two sides of the protected control. Protection creates the ability to uh, makes bankers reckless and incompetent because there's no consequence on the funding side if they are reckless and incompetent. But then the price of that political protection is that they have to use the funds in a controlled way, which tends to be very risky. So whether it's real estate in, in a democracy or protected uh, firms in an autocracy, these are the two gorillas, the two sides of um, protected control. And what's been interesting is all along, we, we have a much better way to protect banking systems during systemic problems. And now I'm going to talk about Russia in 1899. So you may be aware that Russia had, was very vulnerable to the shock coming from France and Germany, the cutting off of trade credit, uh, having to do with a crisis that was being basically imported into Russia at that time. And uh, the Russia had a, a system of very sophisticated universal banks, of course, hundreds if not thousands of publicly traded companies, and a, a universal banking system sort of on the German model operating in Russia. Many different exchanges in at least five cities in, Ru in Russia there were stock exchanges. So it's a very sophisticated system. Then this crisis hits, and who's in charge? There is no central bank, but there is a, a treasury minister. What's his name? You all know Sergei Vita, right? And so what does he do? He, it becomes a lender of last resort. So I want to emphasize every country at this time had some kind of lender of last resort, even if it was unofficial. What he did was personally go around and audit the banks, decide which ones were OK or marginally OK, provided treasury assistance to those banks on a limited basis, then there were a few banks that he decided were deeply insolvent, and he let them go. One of those bankers committed suicide, by the way, in a fairly famous story. How many of you know the crisis that I'm talking about? Have you read about it, studied it in school? One. It's a pretty interesting event in Russian history, actually. So the point, though, is that this notion of lender of last resort assistance, I don't want you to think I'm saying governments can't protect banking systems. The point is you don't do it with unconditional across the board protection. You do it with selective, smart protection that still allows some very bad players to fail. And that way of doing things is the good technology of lender of last resort that's existed and been perfected over many decades. But what happened just the day before yesterday, we didn't have this regime of across the board protection. If you look in 1960, you'll see there's only one country in the world that has deposit insurance, it's the United States. And even as late as 1980, there's only about 15 countries that have it. But then somehow, from 1980 to 2010, that went to 100. So here's a phenomenon. How many of you have thought about this phenomenon of the worldwide sudden spread of the protection of banks Guess what? It was a major feature of the last 20 years of the 20th century. It happened overnight. Banking from 600 BC to the present never had it. And in 20 years, the whole world switched. That's a story for another day, except what I will also point out is I could tell you a similar story about real estate. This is real estate lending as a, fra a fraction of total lending. Uh, 100 years ago, 30% was the number. By the end of the 20th century, it was almost 60%. That's just for a sample of 
uh, about 17 countries, 17 countries that were uh, developing countries in the 19th century and now all developed economies. So the point is, if you want to know well, how did this pandemic of crises happen, notice the world changed. You got protection and control, and you didn't have that before. Where, why does this bad thing happen? How did these gorillas get, why are these things happening at the same time? Well, some research that I have recently shows that actually they're connected. Of course they're connected. Governments protect you as a bank in order to control you. And so empirically, I have a paper with Sophia Chen that shows that if you look at the generosity of deposit insurance, what you find is that when deposit insurance generosity increases, the fraction of real estate finance also increases, all else constant. So the point is there's a political deal being made. OK, so if everything I'm telling you is true, I'm sure it is, then why are people learning, not learning to have disciplined freedom instead of protected control? And of course, the answer is politics is constraining our choices. We don't learn in some neutral way about economics and then do it because, oh, we've learned the right thing to do. And the point is, of course, it's very useful to politicians to have banking systems as their instrument. It's off budget. So the control is off budget. They get the banks to make subsidized loans that they don't have to pay for. And the protection they do have to pay for. But usually when the financial crisis blows up and the government has to protect the banks, that's the successor of the current president or the current prime minister who has to do that. So this, uh, this is the politics of how the world changed. And it's a very dramatic one. I want to illustrate this political thing with an example. The first country to have nationwide deposit insurance was the United States in 1933. It's one of the main legacies of the New Deal. President Roosevelt did not want it. You might think he did because it's one of those main legacies. Here's a quote from him that was published in a letter he wrote to the newspaper explaining during the election of 1932 why this was a terrible idea. And that was based on some historical experiences he was familiar with. He said, it would lead to laxity in bank management and carelessness on the part of both banker and depositor. Notice he already understood that depositors were the funding source that was disciplining the bankers. And he realized that the carelessness of the depositor was essential to the, the carefulness of the depositor was essential. And then he said, it will be an impossible drain on the Treasury. So both it would create a disaster and the Treasury would have to pay for it. OK, so what are we going to do to fix this problem? Um, well, of course, the best thing to do is not to do it. Uh, but once you have deposit insurance in place, it's very hard to get rid of. So I've been writing a lot of papers about ways to come up with better solutions to these constraints. But you have to first start off by recognizing the politics that are driving it. So the best strategy for getting rid of this problem in the US is to create a new coalition that would actually favor an explicit on budget subsidization of housing for low income people. Because if you did that, then you wouldn't have to do it through the back door in this very costly, financially risky way. So that gives you an example. And that you could combine that reform with a reform that would not necessarily reduce deposit insurance or eliminate it, but something that would make it less relevant by requiring banks to have new funding sources that were at risk on top of deposits. So I'll stop there. I don't want to take too much more time. I just wanted to say, when you're thinking about the topic that, uh, of diversity, in this case, it's what I call the Anna Karenina theory, which is the great diversity really reflects all of the bad ideas about control and protection. Because if we didn't have those, we wouldn't have diversity. Everybody would be doing what Scotland had perfected by 1750, or Germany or Russia had implemented the full universal banking version by 1900. So diversity is really an example of failure. And convergence toward deposit insurance is another example of failure. Because it's a, an example of how 
everyone starts discovering, the politicians start discovering the usefulness of protection and control. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. A rare moment, actually, when economic analysis goes with political analysis. Because quite often, I'm left wondering, frankly, you know, so why do those idiots in the governments do the same thing which economists don't advise? To, and maybe they have class interest. And here we hear about it. So next. Shall we talk Russian? Yeah, probably. Russian is better. Well, more natural, less natural. It's actually, you know, the moment of taste. But as most majority of our people in the audience is Russian speaking, I would like to speak Russian. Uh, colleagues, I see there is no point to prove that history is useful for understanding if people gather here in the history session, that means that they're interested in this and they do believe that they need to know this, that they need to get more knowledge. But I will just actually quote a brief example in one of the large uh, Alku Java concert that he had in my city, and I'm from St. Petersburg. So he was asked a question, why do you write historical romance? And Alku Java got really surprised or even pretended to be astonished what, shall, what else shall I write about you? If, for example, we are talking about the future, then is the uh, science fiction. But if I'm not writing about anything else, then this is the history. So the applicable history is nothing more rather than the application of our experience to our current day and future actions. And as you've already heard, that we can talk about doctors as uh, about applied biologists. The same thing, you can talk about politicians as of people who use their experience of the past in order to conduct the political activity. And if the economists, they know their experience and the experience of the past uh, economists, they know based on this experience what to do in the future. But nonetheless, I would like to discuss the following. We have. A great example of the way the historical uh, experience may be useful for today and tomorrow. The conditional name of my presentation is Digitalization in the USSR, what went wrong? So now we need to ask, why do we use the term to this period of history? Well, probably the answer is absolutely simple. The digitalization that we use here and there means nothing more rather than interpretation or translation of different meanings, notions into a digital and quantitative form. Therefore, the first digitalization was the moment when we thought about a bark stone movement or actually moving piles of stones or shells or any other items. The second essence of digitalization is when different qual quantitative approaches and methods Computing devices, computers are used to change the management system in order to take or make any decision for the real change of the way a person lives, conducts his or her economic activities. In this case, digitalization appeared much at a later stage rather than the first computing devices. But nonetheless, in the USSR, as I believe, we had very interesting and uh, very peculiar events that could be interpreted in different ways. Based on the very same facts and events, we can construct absolutely different interpretation versions of what was going on. And based on these different versions, we can get different recommendations for today. And this is what we propose to discuss today during our session, maybe at the later stages in different discussion clubs or sessions or publications. Why do I believe that current digitalization is crucially important? It's not just because it's so hype. Two years ago at Gaidar Forum, we had only one session dedicated in a way to this type of service, it called like banking services without banks. And we were discussing the way the fintech, 
A new digital technologies affect the traditional banking. This session was only one. Last year, the sessions related to cryptocurrencies, new technologies, digital tech, we had, if I remember, five of these sessions. Today, this is getting more like all Soviet system when actually we had different solutions of the parts and bodies and government. And after that, every ministry and every company or enterprise had to conduct, actually discuss the task of the party solutions and obligations. And now we need to think about digitalization in transport, education, medicine, and healthcare. Sometimes it's absolutely correct, but sometimes it turns out to be a way to apply political force to show that we are as cool as any other countries. Moreover, it's a way to get additional financing. This is great, of course. Well, yet another thing. If we compare about the Soviet situation, so the uh, level of state economy is going up constantly and steadily. Therefore, all the problems that we used to have in the USSR Soviet economy in this or that way are reproduced in the state structures and authorities we have at this moment, although we have the market economy. But if we talk about the state share in this market economy between something 50 or 60 percent, and even more in banking services, then the question is, what was wrong in the USSR year? Probably we can address this matter. My presentation, that was the introduction to my presentation. And now I am going to have three small blocks. The block number one, what was going on in reality? Up to 1985, because after that we have a different story. The second part, why this was happening the, that way? And what were the main challenges and reasons on the way? And the final part is an attempt to explain myself and probably convince you in a way why these events and lessons are important, why may we get the, well, ideas, the way we can move and act. The great question, what is the start date of digitalization in the USSR? Probably the right spot would be the uh, fiction year 1925, because at one of the discussion in communist economy in 1926, when they were discussing specific quality, quantitative parameters of the Soviet economy using the Marx uh, reproduction theory, one of the participants said that they created the computing device that enables to con conduct some calculations in the economy and that this machine over time will be useful. Unfortunately, my searches of what that was like and what traces we had out of this unit. So I got no result, but if somebody gets interested, I will provide you with specific reference where you can actually try to look for this spot. The second part, it's maybe the main one, is like 1936 when the uh, Automation and Telemechanics magazine started to publish and it still exists. Moreover, the, we have uh, issues published in the internet. You can access, download it free of charge. And this is a quite good cybernetic matter where they discussed the automation, automated management theory. And sometime before the war, the Soviet hero Lebedev started working on some computing devices and even tried to make it. So the war has made a pause in this assessment, although we had different uh, things going on that had a significant effect on the computer field development in the USSR. 
during the war we started different radio location works and we had a memory what that actually they reported to Stalin the importance to creating the specific divisions for radio location and radio identification of enemy fields and uh, aircrafts and the types of equipment we need to produce in order to locate, identify, and shut down the enemy equipment. Later on, all this subject matter, well, didn't seem to be quite important. The more important nuclear project actually got the priority because when you, you know, the nuclear bomb test, although our nuclear project started earlier before this year, and actually it included an engaged counter-rollage, and we had the order of the Ministry Council of the USSR dated back to 1948 on the 3.5 pages. It's like a business plan for works and creating a plutonium, although it is called in a different way. And these documents are decrypted and published. We have six volumes of the nuclear project, and it actually indicates that the calculation machines and devices should be transferred to the new lab created for the nuclear project, Kantarovich, demobilized from the fleet, and transferred to the special lab. All the participants and key players provide with the uh, apartments in Moscow. They had the bonuses for creating the, this uh, substance for the nuclear bomb. And also, the candidate of Sakharov provided a room in Moscow in a hostel. <coughs> Stalin signed up this order. That was 1947 when they dealt with calculation tasks. At the same time, in 1948, they had agreed on the creation of radio location system using the calculation matters like related to the radio location of technical matters. And when uh, they received data on uh, creation uh, computer machines in the U.S. used first and foremost for military purposes, electric work started in the uh, USSR, of course, and in 1948. Lebedev, academic, not academics at that time, but very active scientist, very active uh, person, received a whole team and they set up in Kiev at Ferrapont of Finnafont of Monastery, I wanted to say, but uh, it was uh, Finnifine uh, Monastery in the outskirts of Kiev, a closed lab. Uh, in one and a half years, 15 uh, uh, specialists designed and assembled the first machine working on the principles of the computation machine uh, designed for, by von Neyman in the US, the uh, output and input system. At the same time, there were other teams in Moscow who worked on uh, computation machines and they were designed for different areas. Lebedev's team, the main area was to prevent uh, rocket uh, attack on the Soviet Union. He worked also in the um, anti-missile protection and Moscow team headed by Romeyev worked in uh, the in uh, the anti-aircraft area. We saw the first moment the Russian historian Lauren Graham uh, pointed out, the American historian uh, pointing out that the funding and influencing of the high management on the um, science is a critical factor. And Graham was also interested in the question that it traditionally um, meant that the freedom gives some uh, privilege for the scientific development. But uh, uh, there was no such freedom in the USSR, but there was a strong influence from the management, and it uh, uh, gave some success. In the late 1950s, it practically uh, provided a strong leap, uh, or end of 40s, sorry. That was the uh, strong leap in the creation of uh, the uh, computers in the US. In the 1950s, active work of different competing groups, competing teams, they competed for the attention of the management, for funding, for uh, 
uh, the priority tasks for different areas, and they had a strong competition in between, which is also an important factor. At the same time, we should understand, but also at that time, important people understood the whole scale, the whole importance and uh, um, Im uh, of, of the computation program. And uh, Kontorovich in 1954 wrote an article uh, about the importance of uh, computers for humankind and human culture, where he wrote that uh, these machines could be used not only in uh, computing, in, in implied computation or in chess, uh, but also in managing transport systems in cities, which uh, is a sign of an acumen and uh, ingenuity of these people. At the same time, we should uh, have in mind that before 1955, the term of cybernetics was a taboo term in the Soviet Union, and the winner's book was translated uh, 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 just immediately in, uh, in 1984. The, his book was uh, translated, but it was stored in a special repository in one of the labs which was working for the Ministry of Defense, and it was confidential. Uh, they were given on only to those who were responsible for creation computers, and it was published in the Russian language much, la much later. At the same time, cybernetics, cybernetic was a taboo after Stalin's death, Naturally, this situation started to change, and uh, the recent anti-cybernetic works dated back to 1954, if I remember correctly. And uh, already in 1955, uh, normal publications were published saying that cybernetics is good. Moreover, uh, an idea emerged that especially uh, computation technique, computation machine, and cybernetics would provide an opportunity for uh, the socialist regime to achieve uh, serious results. So they moved from cybernetics to informatics, to computer technique, computer science, and uh, the first ideas of creating computer centers uh, date back to 1956. In 1958, Kitov, military, Technician, military specialist, published a book in Znania Publishing House, which is also now openly available in the internet, saying that the Soviet Union should create a system of uh, data centers which will combine the whole uh, economics of the Soviet Union in a joint network. And using this data center, it will be possible to exchange information. And this information will be available for the management. It will be available in regions. And using this system, it will be possible to um, rule, to manage the whole economics. A very well-known uh, academician, Glushkov, already in 1962 managed to convince Kosygin with this idea, and Kosygin gave a go for creating a project and preparing the project, which uh, was later, later was called the uh, State Automized Management System. But here we see specific features of the Soviet economics and Soviet situation. Because Glushko, believed that a communist management managed economics will uh, give it possible to avoid monetary and avoid avoid money uh, settlement it will provide an opportunity to manage the economy without money without cash and the soviet union made the same mistake the total computerization was perceived as a clear alternative to the market and by the efforts of a number of people, it was created as an alternative to a market. So on one hand, uh, there were works to uh, computerize different production areas. On the other hand, there was the state plan with their own data center, and it had uh, own computation model uh, used for pl 
happening, and both systems were not quite connected between each other. At the same time, there were economists trying to prove that uh, the main thing is not the digitization, but economic reform. They claimed that it's not possible in the situation which was in the Soviet Union at that time to achieve significant improvement of the economy given the system of uh, management, economic system, which existed at that time. And so it happened that people who lobbied Kosygin reform uh, uh, contributed to the blocking the general uh, management system based on computers and they put a break on digitization. And on the other hand, the Kosygin reform didn't give results it could have given if it was uh, uh, conveyed using free market mechanisms, which was uh, implied initially. So the situation was quite interesting. Computer systems uh, become, began to lag behind from the West. On the element basis, it was clear that uh, Soviet plants do not produce necessary amount of machines uh, of proper quality to create computers, and it was clear that uh, they had to use the uh, Western experience. And the principal discussions what to do was uh, launched in 1969, and now we could have different interpretation. The condition of the patriotic version was that the fatal mistake was done at that time because uh, they took the Western approach. It was decided to develop Soviet computer uh, industry based on IBM 360. Patriots believe that if an opportunity was given to uh, the Soviet specialists, Soviet technicians to roll out and to use the experience and the developments they had, the whole history would go a different way and Soviet Union could have uh, an opportunity to successfully compete against the uh, US. Uh, uh, in the middle 50s, they were no lagging behind, by the way. And uh, at the point of first computers in 1964, in the, the, the USSR, it was 1948. On the other hand, by borrowing the Western technology, there was a chance t by using the engineering potential and using the state support to make a leap forward. Those who were working, were working in that uh, area, they didn't uh, read the uh, Shinkron's book, but uh, there was an idea that if we use the American idea, we will break through. But there was no breakthrough at that time. And those who are now patriotically pro trying to prove that there was a fatal mistake, they forget that in 1969, there was not a question about ju having just Russian uh, developments against the Americans. There was a question, try to copy IBM, which was successfully done in uh, the GDR or try to cooperate with an English company, ICL, which was practically using a, an upgraded IBM system. So in 1969, as a matter of fact, there was no alternative. Soviet-American, there was an alternative to whom to cooperate. And the patriots, they don't want to admit and don't want to understand, but at that time, by means of different political discussions and decisions that was decided at the SEV uh, Association, it was discussed with the Bulgarian and Hungarian specialists, it was decided to take IBM 360 as a basis. EE system was created, we didn't provide the uh, breakthrough neither in the performance nor in economic growth. But there is an alternative version. This economic growth was not provided, not because uh, bad, or, uh, bad development of digitization, but because the economic mechanism itself, the standstill that, it, that was discussed a lot, didn't allow to properly implement a general state management system. And the general state management system was evolutioning to a uh, si management system. And uh, in 1961, there was, um, there was an idea to combine these to approaches and to create the ASU system, the automated um, system of management. I should say a few words about the fact that the historian should know its uh, area very well. Here I have an advantage that I was part of one of the ASU uh, projects. Uh, 
and uh, based on my personal experience, I can understand why it failed. We created the system of uh, automated system of fire protection for forests. And in this system, there was no failures, no mistakes of uh, Soviet system and the market system at that time, because it was a semi military organization and everything was crystal clear there. If there is an instruction to make three flights a day over the territory and there is gasoline for that and the, the pilot didn't fly, the whole uh, loss, the whole damage for the fire, fire is on the pilot and on the head of this base. The system was quite strict and quite severe. There was no bargaining, no plans, nothing. And still, in this system, there were defects. These defects were first and foremost in the area that we didn't have proper statistics. And this was a principal problem of information in the Soviet system. And uh, it was discussed in the first session that Gaidar was one of the first persons who pointed out that in hierarchical system, information goes in a way that it being transformed when going bottom up. And the information about fires in the Soviet Union was so confidential. So for us to take some data for our model about these fires, I uh, was uh, allowed to go to a central base and not even copies, but just uh, uh, write down by hand some figures in order to use them later in uh, our computer uh, computations. And, and when I copied these figures, I was really surprised because in one of the regions, uh, the figures on the burnt out forest for one year was one million hectares sharp. One million hectares. That was a round number to the question that in the Soviet Union there was no fires. But now in the bad the democracy, the, there, were, there are fires. But one million, one million hectares in the Soviet Union. I went to the deputy head of the aviation base and asked him, look, well, uh, for all the years, for all regions, the figures are uh, with the precision of one hectare. Now I have one, one million hectares. Why? He said, well, honestly, just the management, uh, well, uh, told me stop to get statistics, otherwise we're all going to be fired. That was the answer how the statistics worked in many automated systems, like also in some systems where there were no problem of resistance. And then we have a very simple story. More and more systems created, the more reports about the successful use of computers in the modern terminology digitalization was sent uh, to the top. And uh, uh, the slower was the development of the economics. The more talks were led after 1968, after Czechoslovakia, that we're going to re replace uh, market mechanism with computer methods. And even Andropov, for his short ruling time, in one of his speeches mentioned that we're going to develop robots and use robots in the Soviet economy that's going to give us necessary growth. Well, and that's why, as a result, we arrived at 1985 with a big lag in terms of computerization from the West with huge problems in economics. But they were discussed in other sessions, in other conditions already. I'm not going to go into detail here. Why uh, something went wrong? First, technological base. In the planned strict system without competition, there was no chance to establish real elements for good computers. Second, the system of relations, and uh, I'm just quoting the system of uh, Communist Party, new, new system, relations, and so on and so forth. There was no technical basis. The, uh, system of relations and institutes which created at that time did not incentivize proper computerization and the new uh, human, well, uh, couldn't come to the world. The existing measurement mechanisms were, uh, were using other methods other than computer systems. And for the this day, we can finish with uh, something which was uh, used by Vladimir Lenin when he uh, spoke about the mess in social democracy and what should be done, we should, we should liquidate the third period of this mess. If we will be able to um, sort out, to first to understand the problems and then efficiently address 
So that's going to be the history lesson, which will be really useful for all of us. Thank you. Hard, isn't it? But I have to. I have to continue. Roman Konchakov, please. Dear colleagues, with uh, a huge respect to English-speaking colleagues, I will uh, continue in Russian. It's really difficult and hard to speak after such interesting message. I uh, uh, also wanted to move on to discussion, and I'm do my best to be brief. And I'd like to continue that the history of uh, automation can be dated back to 1907, to the Imperial period when Hermann Kolbeck machines were used for first statistics calculations for a Russian census in the Russian Empire. And uh, well, uh, and uh, that was the first time when they faced the problem that uh, purchasing equipment is only half of the problem in only half of the case. And it's not possible to solve a task without changing the process itself based on the new technology. That's why, despite the use of uh, computer machines, uh, still there are a lot of questions to the results of this census and uh, to the historical statistic in general. But it doesn't mean that we cannot uh, study it and we cannot work with these data. My message today uh, is more illustrative. I would like to discuss our project of uh, studying economic dynamics of regions and the fact how important is it to get uh, uh, fresh data on the economic history of Russia and how these data are important in order to uh, include Russian case in the great divergence uh, study. I'm going to talk also about the different optics. Um, uh, Georgi outlined great divergence uh, as a macro event which uh, uh, shaped the uh, picture of the whole world, but the great divergence idea contained smaller parts, smaller areas related to the deeper understanding of details of the process. And first and foremost, I'd like to tell you about the small European divergence, about the regional divergence processes, which also uh, were uh, interesting for researchers starting from the previous century. And uh, in, our, in the middle of our project is the study economic dynamics of a Russian region. Uh, and uh, more on, I'm going to tell you about some very simple ideas that we may use as a useful experience provided by historical research. Our task is to gain economic trends. First of all, we targeted the over Russia dynamics trend, but we realized it's a giant country and it's impossible to go by the overall country aggregated notions. And we are not able to identify the reasons and the root cause of different events. And we decided to verify this. Moreover, we also decided to open the data. We provide the publications of the new repositorium in Russia. And I'm going to tell you more about this. We are studying at the Jane Point. We have a similar project. These are the start project for economic or historical statistics. The project had it by Andrei Markevich. And uh, was provided in Resh and in another project that emerged in the Center of Economic History and Historical Informatics in Urgu, led by Marina Barotkina. It also targets the long rows of data. So, in what way are we different from other resources? First of all, it's important to understand that in order to generate the overall picture of economic history, as well as the regional story, and in order to 
analyze the um, difference, uh, diverge, convergence projects of regions, it's not just enough to have the data of different slices in time. It's not enough to have long ways, long lines in order to explain and describe the picture. Therefore, we decided to get the time rules for the regions. In this region, we started using a very doubtful source called the reports of the governors. It actually covers most part of, well, it covers the 19th century. So we based this report as the state reporting document in early 19th century and the last century. And then it was actually prepared in the revolution Russia. There is an opinion that governor report could be filled with different editions and that it wasn't just a formal document but however based on the soviet history studies and based on our work we can actually say that the statistics of this uh, of the governor is exactly the same as any other statistics it's actually the mirror of the state of the country a lot of things depended on the governor personality, attention to the statistical matters, and attention to his uh, governorate, because it reflected the quality of documents. Also, we found out that it was impossible to run the researches in regions in the situation when we see the changing of borders. When the state the status of some important venues, for example, like this city, when the um, border is not clear or that it may change depending on the time, so it required additional work in creating the map of the European of Russian Empire that in reality probably I will shall tell you in a different way is like a separate very large um, research with the your chronological codex the code of all the changes in borders throughout the 19th century and we can use this space and territory data and compare that with the statistics. Here's the portal of code that we prepare. We actually move it to Renapodap domain, and very soon it will be available. It enables you to operate the governor's data with the industrial, with the industrial statistics, the crop statistics, and some other cartographic data. And I believe it will be quite useful. Well, a lot of a little bit about the reports. So this is the availability of the reports. The darker the color is, the more reports we found for this period. We counted up to the 1960s. Then after that, they started typographical. And actually, they were printed in type uh, in print houses, and that's why we have more of them available. So we can easily see that our project cover starts from uh, 1884 up to 19. The governors themselves they characterized these reports as follows. Then probably it's not quite the precise information, but we believe that. But I hope that in many significant respects it is not too far from the reality. We decided to take different provinces. At the moment we study more than this. We wanted to cover all the provinces. And we decided to select the basis of multi-dimensional typology for about 1900. And here are uh, the results I would like to present. The project FARC is connecting and analyzing indicators of agricultural developments. So Russia is the country of regions. And in order to understand what is going on in the whole, you need to study the situation in separate regions. We 
collect the data here, the data on agricultural output, prices, investments, industrial development, human capital. Dmitry is here, and he is able to answer the questions related to the historical part. Here is a very simple graph showing the national product and uh, agricultural output or harvest output. So we see that agriculture sector had domination importance in the Russian economy, at least in the last quarter of the 19th century. Let's check the original data showing the production of bread for 50 provinces. So the 50 provinces is orange. And then we see that Ekaterina Slavska increases the um, production in other provinces like Tambov, of quite all production centers. They can hardly improve it. So we can see here that there is a limit. And we have some situation, if not a crazy crisis, but then a stagnation like Moscow. At some points of time, they have a backwards trend. They decrease the production. And we can easily explain it. The next graph shows the dynamic in producing the main bread for 50 provinces of uh, European Russia. So it says that we have a slight increase in slope. So here we have this cyclical effect. But nonetheless, we see that the production on bulk food goes up. If we check the constituent elements of these dynamics, we see a more complicated picture. So the growth of the new map producing columns is like Ekaterin Slavsk, stabilization in Tambovsky and the regions selected by the industrial areas, like Kiroslavska province, it actually shows that this process is much more complicated than the national trend. Here we also have a similar graph for the consumption per capita in different regions. We see that the consumption per capita increases in the US region and shrinks in the uh, northwest region. It actually doesn't accumulate the indicators of the all 50 provinces. If we talk about the industry and industrial sector, we see similar processes. So here I would like to show you this graph because it's actually the uh, selection of sampling it's like Tambovsky and Yaroslavsky province. We know that Yaroslav province is an industrially, industrially developed region, and Tambov is the agricultural developed region. So, but that was not the case. At the very beginning, in early and mid 19th century, these provinces were at the, well at the same level of industrial development. And then the Tambovsk region aims at the process of the works processing the food products, it stagnates, and then Yaroslav goes straight ahead. When we compare the data, the governor's reports give us such an opportunity. We see the way the trends change each other within the, within the uh, region. For example, slowly Yaroslav becomes uh, becomes industrial, but Tambov turns into the bread producing region. I'm just sharing the conclusions that this data allows us to make. I would like to say here that the main conclusion out of this presentation is that we face 
with the fact that regions are not just simply different, but they're different in different periods of time. They develop a different pace and create a very complicated picture that may actually explain the situation that at the end, during the lack of the crisis, we face the crisis. And it may be the reason of the original disbalance or divergence of the system. And probably I would like to finish up with the Douglas Norris quote. Economic history is an endless, depressing tale of uh, miscalculation, of miscalculation leading to famine, starvation, deceit and warfare, death, economic stagnation, decline, and instead the disappearance of all civilizations, even the most cultural inspections of today's news suggest that it is not purely a historically phenomenon. Therefore, without taking into account the dynamics for all these issues, so we cannot go for right policy without this. We can open up a discussion then, of course. A uh, microphone, and could you please introduce yourself? Please remember that we have the record and the interpretation. Vitaly Vitorovich Mergentov, University of the Charity of the International Economic um, Relations, the head of the economic science professor. It was a privilege for me to listen to the presentation. They were productive. But the question is, Remember that the first presentation was made by the Church Rawlinson. It was quite interesting to check the uh, context of other colleagues. Well, don't we have a complex of incompleteness in Russia when we say that we don't know how to calculate or do something? Maybe we are not sure of our capabilities. It's like, you know, maybe a complex or substantivation. If we take the 18th century in Britain, let's take Nicholas Crafts. Seven indicators, no more. Uh, if you take uh, Stephen Broadbury, well, from the 13th century, and for each, for each year there are indicators of GDP growth. Well, how come? То есть, почему все это происходит, на чем все это основано? I will try actually to talk Russian, nonetheless. I actually know at the moment I'm talking, is it like we're suffering from the uh, inferiority complex? Maybe the colleagues are telling us a very interesting thing, but if we dug deeper to see the root cause of the problems or see the base, we find out a lot of interesting things. If we take the economic history of the United States of the 18th century, we will find a lot of interesting things with the Indians or without the Indians, what assumptions we get there. There are a lot of things we need to reassess and rethink. Probably. And of course, if we take uh, some economic history of uh, the Netherlands, then it gets a bit better because it's a very small country with the small territory. And of course, could you please select one language only? But you know, one spoke Russian, one spoke, two spoke Russians and English. It's quite difficult to decide what language to start. But if we take Jan in London once under, so, and of course, they saw, this is the Netherlands economist and calculated everything very carefully, and the next one corrected it. But it's a small country. It's a small territory. You could easily calculate everything. But if we take some assumptions and assessment of agriculture development in Great Britain, then OK, some regions that could be easily calculated from the King of John, but then we get a very interesting conclusion. Can we extrapolate it to the most part of the territory? What is your question? I asked the question from the very beginning. Don't we have in Russia inferiority complex in a way that we exaggerate the achievements of our foreign colleagues? And about Nefodov and Mironov and Ikraman and Kondre, to what extent their achievements 
as they were also working in this field, both, maybe we shall also to count in this. I'm absolutely confident that we could talk more, but I'm ready to answer. Complex. Don't you feel like inferiority complex? If you have paranoia, it doesn't mean that they are not keeping an eye on you. It's uh, the same thing. If you think that you don't have any complexes, it doesn't mean you don't have any in history, you know? Digitalization is a very curious and peculiar thing because we had some independent developments and projects of the world great class. BESM-6 was a very interesting calculation system, machine made with our hands. Even in a nuclear project, we have data the way we used or we didn't use the uh, um, intelligence data from Manhattan Project. We have discussions that somebody from German engineers who did the file during the nuclear air project got avoided and the Soviet engineers didn't get any medals. In calculation equipment, we had no such problems. They were produced in our cell, with our cells, without even resources. I, frankly speaking, could not find any resources seeing that we used the Western developments all the way to the moment when we decided to use the IBM experience. And in this case, I don't feel myself any historical complex because soon we have a lot of things to be proud of. But furthermore, I got a question, why weren't they implemented and actually led to this very stage? And one stage, Guy Dar answered in one of the recent interviews when he said that if you produce oil, then you will have investments no matter what regime you have. But if you want to produce some contemporary technological process, you need to have a competitive environment, the great judicial system, and also the civil society. Probably we had the problems in this field. But now I believe the question is not of complexes, but the problem is what to do and how can we overcome the lagging behind we have. Is it we can actually do it trying to make up something ourselves? Okay, let those who invent new things do it, or we shall learn how <coughs> to borrow and do something else uh, based on this. And the people who are busy with the calculation equipment and her teachers, I just ask why tigers, Asian tink tigers, borrow the equipment and start to produce great computers and telephones. But we didn't do this. The answer was in a more Buddhistic manner. We're not Koreans. Why? They managed to do this just because they're Koreans and we're not. I don't know the answer, and probably this is the base for the following researches. But I don't feel we have complexes. Roman, do you have any complexes? A small comment from my side. I want to share with you my complexes, of course, but first and foremost, we have rocket complexes, missiles. It's a very good answer to the question that we have missile systems. I thought first that the question about the imperial past and the longitude draws and long perspectives, but uh, I feel that here there's no no uh, there's no uh, inferiority complex, and it's it's a very uh, relevant and tragic task, if you may, to create national databases of economic dynamics. The question is about that the situation now is that Broadbury and Zanden books and other authors, they are already written, and we don't have such books, such uh, papers. You were right by saying that we have two big uh, researchers, Mr. Mironov and Mr. Mnifyodov, but I'm not willing to talk about it because it's more ideological uh, dispute, and sometimes we see at the same date or close date uh, some controversial things could be stated. I believe that apart from other reasons in the context of your question, the, one of the reasons is that 
there's lack of data. We don't have enough data which we could place on one uh, scale or on the other scale of our argumentation. I believe that this is related also with the lack of our original data, because such enlarged vision, uh, these large-scale optics, if you may, makes us to lose very smaller things. And so, indeed, our project at this stage is focused around data. This is not an inferiority, and it's not lagging behind. It's just our next stage of our development, and that's going to be another stage, I'm sure. May I uh, say a few words, please? I also want to say a few words, and using uh, the fact that I have a microphone now, I'm very brief now. First, about uh, uh, the secret. Secret. I'm really curious person, and I asked um, very, uh, one, economic, uh, one historian from the West who also reads in Russian about Mironov and Nifyodov. He was very careful in answering me. He told me, Nefyodov could be checked, but Mironov could not. And the second, about complexes, about complexes. If we take publications, if we consider a publication a YouTube lecture, I will recommend you Stephen Kotkin lecture called Stalin at War. Stalin at War. He says, yes, of course, the uh, nuclear bomb was stolen, but to, they had to know how to steal it and then know how to produce it. And my favorite example is that in 19th century, uh, rifles uh, were borrowed by in Russia, and uh, Osman Turkey was borrowed it. But Turkey has continued to import them, but Russia uh, designed own rifle. And this is a long tradition traditional trend, I think. And the last thing about regional uh, aspect, please pay attention that maybe maybe you know, but maybe someone doesn't, that the term of the great divergence dates back to the book of the year 2000, uh, which was called Great Divergence Comparison, written by Pomerantsev, uh, comparing China and England. The main criticism was about where is China and where is basically England. So let us uh, take the uh, delta of Yangtze River and let's compare uh, plums to plums and apples to apples, at least with the uh, delta of Volga. Well, we are really in the front forefront. This is about complex, yes. Thanks. I'm sorry, just a small comment. Uh, since we spoke about the Soviet nuclear bomb. They had the data from the Americans, but did it in their own way, at least they say they did. More questions, please. Please, microphone. Use the mic. Please, here you go, Leonid. Professor Borodkin uh, is sitting in the back row. We'll just wave him. I'm now glad to see a normal Russian discussion here. Just a few words on my side, from my side, uh, Borodkin Moscow University, about complexes. I just a little bit switch the subject very briefly. It's not the essence to have complexes, maybe, but despite and unlike big powers which have serious economic uh, researches. We didn't have uh, this uh, product on the agenda. There are papers from Bovikin, our famous uh, economist and historian, who wrote that economic history in our country was uh, uh, putting on hold for the whole Soviet period because he showed that mm, that was not so bad everything in the pre-revolutionary economics. For instance, together with Van Zanden, uh, some 20 years ago, we took part in the Congress of Economic History, and we moderated a section there on uh, inequality, trends of inequality, and measurements of this notion. And it turned out that these big countries have long roles, like in France, there were annals uh, and climatrists uh, in the States, and 200 years of dynamics for salaries, 200 dynamics and statistics for prices in the country, 200 or 400 years, uh, GNP, 
in different uh, ways and different views. And in these sections in Congresses, we're just to decide because we didn't have this data. Why? There are different reasons. It uh, I don't think it's useful to talk about it now, but today I believe it's very important what we see. We see a long dynamics, more or less long 100 years. In our project, we took 100 years of uh, macro um, economical indicators of uh, Russian development, and uh, but we didn't there was no so much attention to this data before 90s as we see now. And in the foreign countries, this uh, attention existed all the time. That's why they build long rows. We didn't have such uh, uh, attention. Now national statistics is built around 100 years, 200 years. Some years ago, the volume was published of 100 years of 20th century. In Nietzsche, Simchera uh, was edited this volume. The, there was at least an attempt to make long rows in order to understand long-term trends. I believe that the question is not just around the complexes, but around the proper understanding that on the background of today's attention to data, datification and digitization, naturally in the economic history we need to build national statistics. And um, it would sound as a rebuke that uh, American economists, uh, Russian exec Paul Gregory, uh, some 10 years ago published a book uh, in translation where he builds these rows of uh, pure national uh, GNP. And it comes from there. But we don't have our own in-house developments. So we can just welcome this, that this attention to data is growing, and uh, data is uh, a platform to pilot different uh, economic theories and approaches. And we do know how, like uh, in the US, the idea emerged of uh, the turned U letter. And we know that the Nobel laureates uh, were engaged in uh, researching different regularities in the past economic development. And we can only welcome the fact that our economists start addressing these issues and start working in this area together with historians. It's not about the complexes, but about the need for serious work with national statistics. Thank you. Yes, please. A uh, short comment to uh, Andre Bilik's words. Then it's going to be a bridge to what uh, Mr. Gaidar wrote. It's very similar. A very simple thing. We uh, do very little with divergence uh, out of the developed countries from 1960s uh, and even Latin America from 90, from 1820s or so. They've become uh, rich, but only 20 countries of them, but more because of offshores. Uh, but as for the developed countries, I have one a student working on South Korea. There are very few, just four, if we take Israel, maybe five, maximum five countries for the huge uh, time, period time out of 180 countries. How many jurisdictions in the world? 235 jurisdictions in the world, 193 countries in the UN, but developed 35 countries. But out of the developing countries, two to three generations and some Latin America's so many, uh, much, much more um, generations if we split it by 25 years. Very few of them became rich. And what is the reason? The simplest reason is uh, the proper quote would be to publish and perish. It, this is the quote which I told you today, Georgio. To perish or to perish. The second perish uh, with E is uh, means to belong to Ankalab. Uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and uh, some other democratic countries, they are embedded in a certain system. And uh, certainly, they uh, enjoyed some benevolence, uh, access to markets, not just American help, not just because of that. Uh, well, because these guys were not very good in something because they had authoritarian governments uh, for a long time, but they were very important as Japan also, for instance. I'd like to remind you, colleagues, after the World War II, uh, when Japan, I have one, 
well, 30 minutes. OK, uh, 30, 30 seconds still. After the Second World War, after Japanese and uh, fascists did to some part of the world, there was a Morgenthau plan, a uh, very well-known American minister not to allow Germany ever become an industrial country. But there were events in 1948 when communists and others started to become stronger in Europe, also in France and Italy. And uh, it was decided to help and to restore Germany. The same happened to Japan when uh, they had a plan a very well known and famous American uh, military in order to to make Japan never to prevent Japan to become an industrial industry but now Chinese People's Republic of China emerged and it was really necessary to to provide some help to another power and Confucian ethics and they were focused on education and development. We do know about this. Something uh, is developed and something is uh, connected to internal and external factors. I'd like to support very interesting uh, uh, views. Uh, just a few words to add for the record that First, I had, um, well, I, I, I kept the uh, phrase of Emmanuel Wallenstein, who said that I'm really old to remember economic magazines of 1950s, where the whole Eastern Asia was uh, written because uh, they have tradition Confucian values, they don't have resources, they have a lot of immigrants and uh, refugees, they have a semi-sovereignty. Uh, what is Taiwan for them? And when in 1980s they started to grow, it's uh, quite interesting that economic models were the same. Uh, the economic models used the same factors to uh, explain their growth. Wonderful Asian values, they were so lucky that they didn't have this resource curse, and so on and so forth. First. Second, Giovanni Origi once proposed and, uh, to analyze uh, world hierarchy from a different side uh, uh, and look at those who not only went up but went down, who lost a few stages in its development. Just take a look at the Great Britain. What efforts people uh, invested to ruin own state in, 19, in the 20th century, and still the pound is the, the uh, fixed currency, and still they are able to make any Brexit they want. Well, uh, now we are entering the political economy area, and this is really interesting to look at in the longer run. Sorry, Carol. A very interesting panel. Um, I'd like to follow follow on uh, Charlie's presentation, if I, if I may, um, and uh, and also thank him. And uh, this morning's pre uh, this morning's presentation was just brilliant. All these people talking about the central bank in great in great. Um, sorry if I speak too fast. Great uh, detail. Okay. 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 <laughs> um, it seems to me what you're pointing out is um, a consequence of divergence. And uh, I would like to know more about that cause, whether it's sort of rational thinking. I mean, when people, it seems to me what you're saying is enormous. And if you don't publish it now, it'll be all over the world and, you know, in, in the media. Um, I could be wrong, but if, if, if what you're saying, I'm not, I don't do bank history, but it's really, really important. And, and that, so we want to know sort of why do people, if Roosevelt understood that, this, that insurance was going to be risky, why did he do it? And why do countries then herd, and these countries which are in a de unstable state, why did they do that? It was it, did they think they were doing the right thing or they were just imitating? In other words, much of this divergence is simply because some countries imitate and others don't. And it, it's part of sovereignty, it's part of culture. Um, I think it's also interesting to differentiate between digitization, which is a very hard technology to develop, 
and something very simple like banking. So to have a successful banking system from a physical technological standpoint really requires almost nothing. That is, as I said, Scotland develops this and it's widespread and known. It's copied uh, in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, it's known in the US and in Canada. They are copied there. So the point is, this is a great example because the, the process of copying the technology is trivial from a physical standpoint. The other reason it's relevant is that from an economic growth standpoint, in terms of producing convergence in growth rates across countries, it's hugely important. Banking system development is an essential driver of a country's ability to develop. So then you, that's what creates this puzzle. And the, the title of my new book, following up on Fragile by Design, which I published about six years ago with Steve Haber, so my new book is called Useless History. And the point of it is that much of the, what we learn from history was useless to people and still remains useless to us because learning about what to do that might be desirable doesn't mean that that, that learning is, is useful if the political calculations make it impossible. So going back to Roosevelt, Roosevelt knew that deposit insurance and protection of banks was a bad idea because eight states had tried it in the 30 years prior to his election. And they had all ended disastrously, all of the systems that were tried at the state level. So he was smart enough, it wasn't very smart, you didn't have to be very smart, to have learned that this was a terrible idea. And then he said so as a candidate. Nonetheless, he had certain things he wanted to accomplish politically. There was one representative in the House Banking Committee named Henry Stiegel, who was very intent on deposit insurance for a particular political reason that has to do with small banks in Alabama, where he was from. Roosevelt needed him to get it. So the American Bankers Association was against deposit insurance. The Federal Reserve was against deposit insurance. The US Treasury was against it. The Senate was against it. Roosevelt was against it. It became the law of the land. Now, to explain that is a longer story, but it doesn't really matter because the point is things that we know are bad ideas, we routinely do. And they have enormous growth consequences. So I think if you take the bigger puzzle, forget banking from it, and you just say, why are poor countries still poor? And the answer is because setting up the, inst the political institutions that are conducive to economic growth is not trivial. Finance is just an example, but it's a very telling one. What it tells us is that the institutions that are conducive to growth are, don't happen very much. So if you look, you were talking about Taiwan, or someone was talking about Taiwan. So if you look in the last, let's say, 30 or 40 years, where are the great examples of countries that have made this major institutional leap? Um, I want to point to Brazil and Mexico. And you know, it's, so uh, Lee Alston, who I'm sure you know well, and I do too, co-authored a book with a couple of political scientists in uh, Brazil looking at the Brazilian transition. And his question was, how did the Brazilians, this is a country that for 200 years was the highest inflation country in the world always. So there's a lot of reasoning behind this having to do with poor fiscal institutions and a lack of ability to commit not to print money. And everyone there knew it was disastrous, but they did it over and over again for 200 years. So the interesting question is, in around 1990, 1994, Brazil changed. It went from the country of high inflation to now, for the last 25 years, a country of low inflation. What happened? How did that happen? And there's a group of economic historians who I like to associate myself with. John Wallace is one of them. Um, Lee Alston is another who are really trying to understand this question of how does institutional transformation happen. And so I recommend Lee Alston's book on Brazil because they try to look at it as a question of 
believe it or not, economists and political scientists talking about where does leadership come from? What is leadership? That's the point of their book. And they, uh, so it's, it's a book about institutional change that talks about, uh, in particular, how political leaders can create consensus that can actually produce real institutional change. And it's a topic that economists don't talk enough about. And I'm not saying that they solve all the questions. But I think the really interesting question here is, we as economists, we know that people don't just, societies don't just learn it, 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 like plants grow. That's not the way it happens. Real institutional change that promotes growth and convergence fundamentally over time is a process of political choice coordination, and uh, it's really essential. I, I'm talking too much about this, but I think it's pretty important, and there's so little that we really know about it. What was courageous about the Lee Alston book is that they tried to actually explain how Cardoso's leadership was successful in reversing a, something that was so ingrained in the culture, corruption and uh, fiscal profligacy, those are the issues, right? How do you take a culture that's co fundamentally corrupt and fiscally profligate for 200 years and convert it? Notice, he wrote that book before the Brazilian prosecutors put Lula in jail. And he, pr and he basically was pointing out the changes that had happened that made that possible. So. You really, we all, I think, especially if you're in Russia, you should be thinking about that book. You should be thinking about how did Brazil make that change where the, that they went from a system where nobody ever went to jail in the political system to one in which they put the president in jail, former president in jail, and one in which they had hyperinflation for two centuries, the highest inflation country in the world for two centuries, to now very low inflation. So it's not about the mechanical process of learning a technology. It's about somehow coordinating institutional change. I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, of course, you know, you just named the recipe. Elect as your president a world system sociologist, Cardozo. I, 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 it, it, that's the point, right? So he was a sociologist who was also a leftist, so he had certain... A particular kind of leftist ideology. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. We have a lot of things to discuss because time is growing sharp. I do understand that it's getting interesting and exciting, but the time is very, very short. Do you have any questions? Professor uh, Abilia. Professor Abilia. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Lord Gordon Brown. Lord Gordon Brown once just said a marvelous phrase. In order to create good institution, the most difficult thing is the first 500 years. I think this is extremely important. So I, I teach a course called Emerging Financial Markets, which is a course on economic development and growth. And one of the early slides I have is how long did it take GDP to double during the British Industrial Revolution? And then how long, did, there's, that's about 50 years. How long did it take during the American Revolution? It's about 25 years. How long in the Japanese Industrial Revolution? 10 years. How long in what we're used to now in China? You know, five years, something like that, uh, in the early phases of the, the most rapid growth. And so what we're used to in today's environment is to think about the growth process in a way that's very different from the historical processes that created institutions, which took centuries. And, but what's interesting also is that I just gave an example of, in Brazil, a country that managed to make institutional change consciously and purposely and dramatically, and I think in a persistent way. That is, this is that was a real change. So, that's the challenge. People don't want to hear that it's going to take 500 years. They want to hear that you have a magic formula 
for moving from a corrupt society to a non-corrupt society, or from a society that's fiscally profligate to one that's not. Um, so I don't think that we necessarily want to use the historical model of the 500-year change. Um, it's, it feels like we can do better than that, but it's not so easy, right? So, you, you know, John Wallace is, thinks about this from a game theoretic standpoint, and he starts with the following paradox. Let's pick a mythical country. I'm sure you won't be able to imagine a country like this. This is a country that's run by autocrats. And those people benefit hugely from their current status quo of their power. They have lots of property rights in, under the current system. Lots of control rents, as we call them, right? They're making a lot of money and power and all the things that come with that. But that means that if, here's the paradox. If they could create good institutions, you might think they'd be the primary beneficiaries of creating the good institutions because they're the ones that have currently the property. All of the increase in the marginal product of capital would accrue to them. The problem is that when you change the rules, you establish a system where they share power. It's not clear that the people who inherit the power are going to respect the property rights from the prior group. This, Wallace argues, is the fundamental restriction on the creation of institutional change. That the people who currently, might, you might think, would be the biggest beneficiaries of reform can't write a contract where they don't end up getting killed after the reform. Извините. Yeah, I guess so. Would you like to, to have uh, the last word? Oh, I think that. The previous session was called whether we need whether the leaders need advisors, and there is a historical joke. When Kikov reported on his idea of the centralized management system, and here we have different options. The first that he reported to Brezhnev, uh, then to the Central Committee to a commission, and said that we can create a system that will enable the leadership to resolve any problems, any economic problems by managing, computerization, etc. And then he got the reply that your approach is incorrect. When we need to resolve a problem in the structure in the USSR, we collect the leading workers, farmers, we uh, advise with them, and based on this, the party generates the only right decision. Kikov asked in reply, please tell me, Leonid, if you feel ill, are you going to gather together the farmers or are you going to call a good doctor? This was one of the reasons he got fired from the Ministry of Defense, because he was chopped in mouth. But we let's hope that these leaders who will want to use their advices and we do hope that they will want to know later, they will call good historians in order not to be a humorist. But we will hope to the better. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. That is what I want to say. But I'm f but at least we call good priests at the very end. So. We have a hope.